Okay, so thank you very much for coming. Um, this is a talk I wrote a little while ago, um, and actually gave a week ago to a New York a group in New York. And it's really talking about transformation. And part of the question is transformation a thing, and we'll come back to that. Um, but I also want to talk about some of the theory around this, but also some of the practical as aspects of that. So it'll be a combination. It's not differentiation between theory and practice. So I'll, I'll move into some of that. But I want to very much ground this in Chile's statement. This is, comes from, his, from one of his older books. The principle of continuity is based on the principle of change. And the reason I found this quite interesting was I think this sort of was reminiscent of where I was about 20 years ago. I ended up working for a large consult one of the large consultancies. And the reason I ended up working for a large consultancy is I saw most organizations undertaking episodic change. That is, they didn't do continuous change. They, they made step changes from time to time. And I saw myself as a change agent. I felt that I couldn't actually work for, work for organizations like that. What I then realized a few hours after that is most large consultancies don't actually undertake uh, org organic or continuous change as well. They're very much actually in the same boat. So I'd like to so I'll come back. We'll come back and actually talk about this later on. Um, and, but one, one of the other aspects I wanted to take out of this was, well, if you, um, most organizations also are in a homeostasis, you know, they, they, they're in a certain set, steady state. As I said, they don't undertake change very often. But the question is, well, if um, a homeostasis actually requires energy to actually maintain that state. So if, they, if you know, this principle holds, continuity is based on change, why don't organizations undertake change on a continuous basis, and therefore spend the energy on something which actually would continue to make them more relevant in the future? Um, so a little bit, coming back in, in a little bit in the theory, this is a paper that um, Ormoyd and Rosenwell published in 2004. And I found this very interesting because what it was looking at is what is the knowledge, how much knowledge can a company actually have about its strategy? And they looked at two um, large, uh, macro studies around companies and life cycles in, in the last century. And they came up with there's two stylized facts. Most organizations fail early, and we, you know, we, t we know that. And that the number of organizations that last a long time is very small, and they tend to be large organizations. And this is what De Hayes talked about in The Living Company. In fact, there's a society for companies of older than 100,000 years. But they went further than that. What they did is they then modeled developed the model with all organizations connected to all other organizations in their, in their model. And they, tried, they simulated basically um, a company's ability to affect knowledge by allowing them to actually play, play with the weightings in this. And what they found was if a company actually knew a little knowledge about the market, actually the model varied from the stylized facts. And if they actually allowed any organization to have all knowledge, then it actually um, varied towards the neoclassical model of all organizations existing for time. So their conclusion coming out of this was actually most organizations can have no, no knowledge about the impact of their strategies on the marketplace. And just to bring this into, into sort of a little story, this is actually the Pillar ICO in 2017. Um, and my mate David Gray, wrote, uh, David Siebel wrote the, wrote the Gray paper for this. And David wrote the gray, it was gray because basically he, he said there'd been enough white papers around crypto at the time. And he, they raised 21 million in ETH and it resulted in the formation of the Pillar Project. But I'd, um, I'd been debating with David over about a decade about this concept of emergence versus and complexity from approaches versus basically traditional strategy. And he was very much more on the portfolio Bayesian logic that you could actually determine outcomes. And I went to him after this and said, David, you know, had you foreseen that really what your white gray paper and pillar was going to be about was something you wrote about in 2010. He wrote a book called Paul, The Rise of Crypto, and specifically it was actually ephemeral and smart contracts, and just the, you know, just the evidence of the knowledge and actually how to do this. And he said he had not foreseen this. That was actually, it was actually a fortuitous outcome in his view. So you know, what I would argue is basically maybe we should draw, cross out the fact that it's tough to make predictions and say you, most organizations can't make predictions about the effect of their strategies. And to some extent, that's really what the lean startup community has been talking about for the last decade or so. 
But what we can determine, and what most organizations probably actually have a fairly clear understanding about, is direction. And this is Sink, a quote from Sinker, the younger, talking about, you know, about direction. This is one of David Snowden's basically favorite quotes. Um, and just two counterpoints around this, you know, Intel and Tesla. Intel, because Intel was seen to be actually um, very foresightful in terms of moving to microprocessors. In fact, the reality was actually something completely different. What was actually happening was on a monthly level, they did, it, they did optimization of the production line. What they were finding was they were starting to premise in microprocessors over memory chips because the Japanese, and in the, in the, going back to the 70s, were coming into the, into the memory market and it was cannibalizing the market, um, their margins. So it wasn't until later that the, the board actually uh, formalized their strategy. Now, in contrast, in Tesla have been always very clear about direction. The, the direction has very much been about actually electrification of, motor, of uh, transportation. The only thing that Tesla probably did as novel was the fact that what they've done is they've attacked the high value, then medium and low. They didn't try to make a mass market car. They actually realized that actually you know, what they wanted to go after was a small market where there was a large margin and use that to build the second generation and then the third generation. Um, and they've actually been very successful with that. Um, but you could go back and also look at Tesla. They didn't actually invent a lot of the technology. It was AC propulsion actually had a lot of that. They'd already moved to basically 18650 cells. They already had a light freight frame and they had developed all the controls, control systems. But Tesla were the only, you know, and they, they were asked whether they would actually build a car for one of the founders of Tesla. And, he, and they said, no, you know, we, we're, we're not in that market. And te, so, so Tesla was formed, Musk came on board. And even at the time, they had a view that this is going to cost them about 100 million to do this. And what we actually understand now, it's probably cost them about 500 million to bring their first car to market. So there was a lot of learnings along the way from them. Um, if you have direction, then the other thing we start to talk about is boundaries. And I stay also, I use this analogy. Um, this is a piece of water on the south coast of England called the Solent. And this was actually, this is a class 40 boat, Roaring 42 from Cowes 2012, which I was navigating. And most 40 foot boats have a draft um, of around two to two and a quarter meters. That is from the water line to the bottom of the keel. This is an open water um, short design for short water Blue, blue sailing. It had actually just done the Corvax St. Tomalo, so it just crossed the Atlantic. And it drew three meters. So that basically meant I actually had to go and look at the charts, a lot of detail going into that week to actually work out what was navigatable. And the owner's wife was very adamant that we shouldn't really be basically compromising it because all their money was in that boat. So you know, if you have direction and you have boundaries, you know, John, Dave Snowden talks about negative stories starting to set this out because what you're starting to do is you're starting to open up the option space. And some people still get it wrong. <laughs> this, this is just, this is when this is the Volvo 2014. Uh, they hit an archipelago and ripped, ripped the keel out of the boat doing 20 knots. And when, you, when I read the incident report for that, it wasn't one single mistake. It was actually, it reminded me of Decker's Drift into Failure. It was actually a series of of things that um, came on. So th shit does happen, and people do get actually held accountable. When they, put the, when they repaired the boat and actually did the last leg of that Volvo race, that navigator was not on board. <laughs> so um, I've talked about direction and boundaries, and I haven't used constraints because I'm going to come back to constraints. But the other thing, um, what I find is most organizations struggle, and this is the thing they struggle with, is this concept called alignment. You know, Bungay talked about this in The Art of Action. In fact, the story he introduces the book, and um, he introduces the book was about the CEOs just actually giving the new talk about the new strategy direction, and a couple of people leaving the room, and they're talking about, well, actually, what does that mean for me? Because you have this perception of, of you know, here's the direction we're going, we've established some boundaries, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, what does that actually mean? So what I find is a lot of time is actually spent bringing people back and staying to focus on the now. And I use this phrase positivity, um, which I've noticed a couple of times during, during the talk, earlier talks today. And the positivity, 
One of the techniques I use here is the micro-narrative. And it's very much about taking and you know, talking to people about well, actually or departments or teams about what actually does this mean now for you and letting them actually own, own this. And the, the technique I use is just simple um, Minto's pyramid method because it's, talk, it's talking about well, actually what are your problems, what would you like to do, how would you actually, how would you take, and you can take this through and get them to actually start to visualize what that actually would mean for them within what we've actually talked about. And that also enables them to start focusing on, on the now. Um, the, I also find there's some other things in, that are useful in here. Um, but the, the other, one of the key things here is re really around um, Keegan's immunity to change. Keegan talks about, uh, talks about the fact that people don't necessarily don't want to change. What they're afraid of is dying. And what I find is that micro-narrative enables you to actually engage them and actually start to actually understand what would actually be relevant. Um, and if you can do that, then you can actually, you know, you can actually make this actually much more pain, painless. Um, there's other things in the A3 and idealized design, which are practices I use in that to actually look at from different perspectives as well. And I want to come on to another, two other aspects. One is temporality. Now, I've used time-based competition here. Time-based competition, of course, is a phrase from George Stark's um, 1988 HBR paper. And the reason I mention that is the story in Certain to Win, um, Chip Ridget's book on Boyd's work around OODA loops, if you're familiar with them. And he talks about um, the Yamaha Honda Wars in the early 1980s, where Yamaha decided, you know, decreed that it was going to be, become the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the world. And Stark talked, pointed out that Honda's response was not actually to build more vehicles. What it did is actually produce more variety in the system. So they actually, in the course of 18 months, introduced 113 new models of variants. Yamaha, at the same time, could only actually introduce 37. And that dynamic basically completely changed, changed it. You know, what, it what it took away from, you know, from this is what Honda were actually able to do was actually include the customer in the loop. So they could build a new vehicle, they could get, get the feedback. You know, you, Gabby was talking about this morning, you know, it's from the operational side, once you've actually got that capability, if you can turn the handle quicker, you're not, you, you can actually find out whether it actually has relevance and start to actually have commercial value, value for you. I'd also argue to some extent, this is really what the DevOps community have been trying to do for the last 10 years. It's, you know, they've, they've talked a lot about the separation, of breaking down the separation between development and operations, but it actually allows us to be done at a much, much faster pace, and that gives you the commercial benefit around this. Um, which brings us on to capabilities, and I use, I still use governing and enabling constraints. I know, uh, you know these were introduced to the community probably a decade or what go, Elisa Giro, Gerardo's Dynamics in Action, um, and then Alicia's new book, she actually drops, drops this and goes for top down, bottom up, because she's she feels that too many people don't understand this or struggle to explain it. But to me, I, I find this um, quite useful. Governing in terms of standards policies, it's the top down, it constrains the operation. Enabling is basically something you're doing from the bottom or the team level, which then enables you to actually have the discussion around whether the governing constraints are actually appropriate. Change the system, you move to a new stable state. Um, but what I don't, and I don't tend to try and come in and tell them the policies, the standards, and all, the, all that's wrong. What I try and do is take an evidence-based approach around this. And the idea is to go and work at a team, potentially team level or some small level, develop this, and then come back and actually have evidence-based discussions. Um, one example recently, we, had, we built um, a pipeline for front end. We took an embryonic pipeline we just added a UI, UI kit on the left-hand side. We basically put added serverless on the right. Uh, the actions were all in GitHub. And what that enabled for the front-end framework team, they could actually do a Git clone and do Hello World in 10 minutes. And that was transform transformational for them. You know, that meant we could actually go back and talk about release policies, product, and actually have a con completely different discussion. You know, why, do you, why do you have focus groups? We can actually just do that, put it out, actually get and measure the actual impact in the market. Again, this is something Gabby was talking about this morning. 
Um, and for, from the services point of view, what we actually built was something of a K8 with an ITSEO overlay. And again, that may seem like a lot of technology for a simple problem, but really what it enabled them to do was actually support um, canary deployments and actually have a, a zero trust, which is one of the other things they wanted to actually do. And we can't leave this without sort of talking about planning. And I think a lot of people, I heard one comment earlier today was basically, you know, hierarchies still have, have value. They do because it's basically a temple. The teams operate in actually a very short temple frame. You know, at the department portfolio level, you're looking at maybe three months in a business level. You know, if you're listed, you're required to actually provide guidance on a 12 monthly basis um, and provide quarterly updates. Um, and this is really encapsulated to some extent from what the flight level stuff is about. And also basically McKinsey's pace layering, if you've come across that. I think the key thing, what, really what I'm getting, you know, what I wanted to get across was the fact that you, you, you're moving away from large upfront planning. If you're actually looking at this on a shorter time frame, that gives you the ability to basically make small changes much more uh, often. You're moving away from the traditional sort of organization seeing as the tankers, which you nudge, to one which is actually much more pragmatic and encompasses sort of much, much more fluid change. And I want to sort of also touch on, and I refer to these as the pillars. You know, if you're familiar with Boyd's OOD, Observe, Orientate, Decide, Act Loop, to me, these are the OO, these are the Observe, Orientates that I use when I'm just looking at a transformation or some piece of work. Um, to give me, to help out. To me, structure is really around architecture, which is my background, and there's two things I look for, for and, and I frame these as coherence and congruence. Coherent is actually, is the architecture going to actually um, stand up, and is actually, is it going to be operable? I remember doing a card settlement system some years ago. Uh, the acquire input was actually file-based, but the client lead wanted to have an evidence, but um, event-based paradigm, and it invested, They'd invested about 12 months in that and before it became evident that actually it wasn't going to work. We had to pull it back and put it all back together. It wasn't a pleasant experience. And the congruence is, well, if you've got a coherent argument, you know, this is the efficiency, the FSE argument. There's no point in building something if it doesn't actually support the direction of the business. There needs to be this, you know, the architecture needs to support the alignment and delivery of these. There's two other things I just want to mention while we're talking about architecture. One's modularity. Um, and if you looked at any of Sandy Mongro's um, pull teardowns for Tesla, one of the key things he sort of comes out and talks about in terms of the Model 3 was the fact that they've got the modularity right in terms of they're using die castings for the, for the, for the well assemblies and engine mounts. And that gives them flexibility. You know, what I've seen is we've moved away from monoliths over the last couple of decades to microservices. But the answer is not microservices for everything. Um, you, you need to get the granularity right. And I'd quite like Uber's, uh, so Uber's DOMA here, domain oriented microservices. And once you get the modularity, you move into the interfaces. You know, API first is a great concept. Um, but I'm old enough to remember Postgres law, and this is amounts to um, Elisa Giro's concept of sloppiness. You don't need to have um, lockstep in here. You know, some degree of sloppiness or variability in the interfaces actually has value. You know, Postgres law was very much um, was the basis of a lot of the command line utilities for Unix, and what it talked about was the output should actually be highly defined, but you should be tolerant on your input. So you shouldn't be in a situation where if the upstream system actually changes the date format slightly, but it's still a valid date, that the downstream system basically is just going to throw that out. So what I tend to do is try and look at the modularity of, of, of architectures and look at some degree of sloppiness in those interfaces. Um, approach, this is an agile conference. Everyone's, every, so I'm not going to talk about basically approaches per se. I'll just call out sort of two um, characteristics around these. What I do find is coming together and talking is actually good. You know, it's the old BT analogy, it's good to talk. But I feel that basically a lot, this is done at the team level, but it's not done at a level above that. If you looked at McChrystal's team of teams um, infused as one mission, which was the operationalization of that, 
Uh, it talked about having basically day, effectively daily coming together every, everyone, but I don't think most organizations can support that. But I think things like the meta scrum, if you come across them in the scrum framework, are quite useful. It's not the scrum of scrums, it's something different. It's basically about development and the product and the business coming together on a, on a weekly basis. And that, I think, is actually quite, quite a useful practice. Um, and the other thing, in part, just in passing, I wanted to touch on was the, what, I, what I'm starting to see is the fertilization of failure. We've talked about the fact that failure was not tolerable traditionally, but we now seem to be fail, you know, deeming any failure to actually be good failure. And if you're not aware, Amy Richardson, um, sorry, Amy Edmondson, whose primary work is really about technology, um, psychological safety, her new book is uh, Right Kind of Wrong. So she's actually writing an ontological framework for failure. And I think if anyone's starting to come up with a fa framework for, um, an ontological framework for this, it says, well, actually, maybe we should c come back and actually think about what we're doing here. Now, if you go back to Popper, it was about basically about falsification of hy hypothesis. And I think that's the lean startup community broadly had that right. Well, what I'm not seeing at the moment, what I'm seeing is that you know, any type of failure is actually right, and that's not right. That's not right. Um, people, this is touching on the hierarchical thing. Not everything needs to be self-organizing. Uh, Fairlove's concept of hierarchy, heterarchy, and self-autonomy self, um, has value. And I think basically what I see is um, most HR departments don't seem to actually understand this. And the other thing is that I still, I feel very strongly these days that the team is the primacy. Um, you know, people may point to Edison, you know, but if you look at basically Johnson's writing on that, what Johnson highlights was Edison actually had a team. And that team was called the Muckers. And it wasn't just the people, um, some people that helped them out. These were people with deep skills in particular areas which complemented Edison's skills. Um, and I, what, what I you know, see is a lot of people talking about teams, but not actually about the dynamics of teams. But I, I won't drag on about that. What I do find is Matt Skelton's um, team of team stuff, quite useful because it does provide an ontological framework. And Matt's very open about this. It's a starter for 10, you know, it's just four types of teams. But that gives you a way to start thinking about how teams actually fit together in an organization because it's not about just one team or one type of team. And I want to touch on two other things, the heterogeneous hit homogeneity question. And this is really, you know, the process, the purchasing department saying we actually need the RFI and we need to establish one standard. Now, the, what I see is, you know, most organizations still perpetuating this model. Open source is actually a great um, source of ideas. Your teams basically can use the open source to actually explore the option space. And if you then don't actually want to invest or don't have the capabilities to support that, then you can actually look at backing that out via you know, a, a service agreement to some organization, whether that's Mongo or Com Confluent, you know, depending on the technology you have. Um, what, I, what I like to do is actually give the teams as much autonomy around the choice of tools as possible but standardize where it actually makes, has relevance. For, so for example, for source code control, Git is the obvious one these days. If you're not using Git, I would question, question it. And dependencies and um, complex coordination, so this is Centalia's, Centola's work. Dependencies, Jim Benson has a great talk, which I, I really, really enjoy. Because Jim sees any dependencies between teams as an opportunity for collaboration. Um, but what I don't, what I dislike with some of McChrystal's work and what I like about Centola's and, and, and why I use it is he talk, um, McChrystal talks about spanner, the bound, spanner boundaries, boundary spanners, the inter, individuals that link the teams. But that's not going to give you the um, you know, idea, transfer of ideas. You've got to go for short, wide bridges. Um, and there's different techniques actually you can use in that space. So just bringing us back to the end, I've sort of taken you through an arc of talking about why um, fundamentally traditional models around basically in-state models don't actually work or have any relevance. 
Um, and what, what struck me when I've been thinking about this is it comes back to, in my mind, you know, with Descartes' Cartesian duality, we separate the thinking from the doing. And while we do that, transformation will be a thing. But I don't think it necessarily needs to be. We could actually break this down. You know, Gabby was talking about this this morning, is basically very much more alliterative approaches. And to make this something, and my, what I'd like uh, and hope out of this is I've given you a different perspective on transformation. And if you could explore some of these ideas, what I hope is that you would actually enjoy the journey and find, find transformation something that's actually de desirable and not something that actually you do, as, uh, do from time to time and is a dreadful experience. Thank you. Yes? I actually may have missed it, so I'm an architect. You said uh, the, uh, I'm talking to a fellow architect in, I'm not one foot in my organisation, and I'm talking about allow sloppiness in interfaces. Is there a proper architectural term for describing that thing that you advocate? Um, no. So there's, there's nothing on InfoQ <laughs> that I'm aware of. <laughs> Uh, um, so this is really um, going back to Alicia's work. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about the bio. Um, I've had a lot of conversations here about biological and the fact that stopping us has relevance. And I just I referenced this in Postul's law. I, I haven't gone back and actually taken it anything. So what's, what's the law? What's the name that you referenced? I think that's what I. Uh, Postul's law. P O S T E L. So if you Google that, you'll find it on Wikipedia. Um, but I haven't seen a paper written up of applying that to an architecture. <laughs> <laughs>